Hong Sun Pat. I'm the director of the Center for International Business <coughs> Education at Loyola Mainland University, uh, which that uh, we actually organized and sponsored um, this uh, seminar today. LMU, we call the SAI, uh, a lot of people didn't say the SAI word, it's confused with uh, C-Y-B-E-R. <laughs> It stands for Center for International Business Education, and some schools actually also put research together. So our center was established last October uh, with a grant from the U.S. Department of Education <coughs> to improve international business education and research uh, for the students, faculty, and also the business community. So today's event is exactly prepared to try to uh, help the business community uh, to increase exports and also that uh, uh, foreign direct investment uh, to Korea. Um, I hope that uh, you will find this conference uh, useful and informative in learning more about the Korean market and also that uh, if you are business practitioners identifying some potential business opportunities in Korea. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, support and thank for some organizations, including the, the LA Area Chamber of Commerce, who provide us uh, with this great venue, and also that the uh, Consul General of uh, Korea in Los Angeles, and also the COTRA. Um, before we start the program, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Daryl Smith, Dean of the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University, and she will say a few words to greet you. Hi, it's, it's great to see everybody. As Jensen said, I'm the Dean of the College of Business at LMU. Um, finishing my first year, in fact, this June will be my first year, and it seems appropriate that I'm uh, making these remarks from this room because uh, my colleague and one of our faculty members, uh, Anatoly, uh, invited me to the chamber very, very soon after I had arrived in, at NLA, and this was my first introduction to the vibrant and very international flavor of the chamber and uh, the economic engine that's truly global here in Los Angeles. So it's a true pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you in programming that um, we are doing in the College of Business as we partner with other organizations to really uh, make an impact in terms of outreach and engagement um, in the community. It's also very important for our College of Business as we try to globalize. Uh, one of the first things we did when um, I arrived after a very long listening tour and finding out what the interests were in our college, and, and Young Sun and I had talked before I had arrived when they were going after that cyber draft, um, was to talk about uh, what, did, what did we aspire to be and who were we? And we spent a lot of time talking about the uh, international experiences of our students and how we could create much more awareness because to play in the business landscape is to be inherently globally minded. Uh, I got very concerned when I talked to a few of our sophomores uh, over the summer and found that they had no idea what a supply chain was. So we're starting to address some of these issues. And uh, in doing so, we've created a new uh, vision and mission for the College of Business. Um, our mission statement really captures uh, the importance of the global community. And our mission statement says something like this. We at the CBA advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. And there's some key words in that mission that really capture just about everything we are doing now to align around what it means to be a member in the global community and to ensure things like appreciation for the power of world trade, to understand that to manufacture a product and to ultimately source for that process requires cooperation and collaboration among countries in the globe. And for any business leader to be developed and to have the confidence and the moral courage to say this is how we operate across borders becomes so powerfully important for the next generation. And we've contextualized all of that around the sustainable development goals and became a signatory to the PRIME initiative from the United Nations, the Principal Responsible Management Education Initiative. So what that has allowed us to do is to think about how will we engage with our partners, how do we engage in our community, and how do we educate this next generation. 
So events like today and the work that's being done in our side is inherently one of partnership. It's significant and we hope that it provides all of you with the next generation who understands what you intuitively know and that together we can learn how to uh, make the global community um, one that serves um, all of its citizens uh, around the world. So with that, I uh, welcome everyone to this event. I thank the side and the celebration business and all of our partners and speakers. Um, and the life of a dean oftentimes doesn't allow me to um, sit and stay and learn with you. Although, if it makes everybody feel better, I am going to become a student in about three weeks when I go in to the SIPES program in Korea to learn more about Korean business. So the next time I'm making welcoming remarks, I feel like I do some with some level of expertise. So enjoy your day. Uh, it looks like it's going to be an incredible program. And, um, and again, thank you all for being here and supporting it. And uh, should you want to be an executive in residence at the College of Business, we are creating space for that this summer. And uh, we would welcome you to come and engage with our students. So thank you. Thank you. So 
Uh, I thought that uh, he's a great person that, that could give us a talk about this uh, important issue. So he graciously accepted my invitation and he flew from Washington, D.C. today. And, um, so let me just give you a brief introduction, although you have uh, his uh, uh, great value in the program. He's currently the Vice President for Asia at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where he develops chamber programs and policies across the region. He also serves as the President of the U.S.-Korea Business Council, where he helps to lead uh, U.S. business engagement with uh, one of the uh, U.S.'s most important trading partners. Before he joined the chamber in August 2018, Mr. Gossett spent more than 24 years in Asia as one of the most senior commercial diplomats. He served in Asia's largest economies, including almost four years' service in Korea before he retired in July 2018. Um, he's a Californian, and uh, he went to Stanford for his undergrad degree, and uh, he got his that, uh, JD uh, from University of Washington's uh, law school, so <coughs> we, we went to the same school. <laughs> okay, thank you. So. Thank you, Professor Baker. <coughs> An agreement with Canada and Mexico uh, to revise NAFTA and now the US MCA agreement, which is um, about um, to be considered by the Congress and is going to be a very difficult debate there. Um, the administration uh, has also just recently held its first meetings with uh, the government of Japan uh, with the intention of negotiating a trade agreement with Japan. Uh, <coughs> remains something that has, was announced last September uh, by <coughs> President Trump and Prime Minister Abe, but um, just the first meeting was just held uh, in the middle of April, and the, still the, the framework for that agreement and the scope of its potential coverage remains under discussion. And then we also have Europe, and a lot of companies that are members of the U.S. Chamber uh, have extensive business dealings in Europe, and the concern over uh, Brexit and the U.K.'s withdrawal from the EU has <coughs> enormous repercussions for a lot of companies. So all these topics uh, basically uh, suck up all the air of the debate and have taken the attention of the trade community in Washington away from Korea, where it had been somewhat focused uh, a year and a half ago um, for the reasons Professor Peck has mentioned. So I think having this conference uh, is sort of uh, something that's really important because I think it's important <coughs> to get our attention back on Korea, which as mentioned is our sixth largest trading partner. And the 2.0 I think is really important as well because uh, in my opinion it's time <coughs> to be looking forward um, at things that the United States business community and the Korean business community can be doing in a forward-looking manner uh, instead of focusing on some of the issues that I'll get to in a second. So uh, Chorus FTA 2.0 is, is a good theme. We've had events in Washington that recently have uh, used a similar title, so um, I appreciate you doing this here in Los Angeles. And I also want to say I think Los Angeles is an ideal place for this conversation. Have right here in Los Angeles, we, as we drove in this morning, a few blocks from here, uh, the Wilshire Grand uh, Center, which I think is really a monument to what cooperation between the U.S. and Korea can look like. Um, that building is really the culmination of a dream um, by the late chairman, recently deceased, of uh, Hanjin Group. Korean Airlines um, uh, Chairman Cho Yong Ho, who just recently passed away. Um, but it was his commitment over many years to build that building. And I know everyone in LA uh, knows how important it is to have a 
skyscraper of that magnitude go up right here in downtown LA. And to me, that kind of talk showed his commitment to the importance of the United States to Korea and something he really wanted to achieve. And so I, I kind of look at that as a symbol of what can be achieved and then building the, the tallest building west of the Mississippi right here in downtown Los Angeles you know, by a Korean investment group. So um, as I talk to people, I really hold that up as something we, we should really respect. Uh, I know a lot of people here know a lot about Korea, so I'm Professor Blake gave a, a brief background. I will just uh, mention, for those of you who may not be Korea, Focus just mentioned very briefly, you know, the Korea development story is a very well known and, and highly inspiring story uh, of a country that went from being um, one of the poorest countries in the world uh, in the 1950s following the Korean War uh, and the devastation of, of that period uh, to its success today. Largest economy in the world. I guess you can debate on the numbers, 11th to 13th, depending on how you want to measure it. But a, a over uh, you know, 1.3 trillion dollar economy, a uh, major trading partner of the United States. But back in those days, and it's important to remember that if you go back to 1960, the per capita income in Korea was $100 per person per year, and it was less. Korea, South Korea was poorer than North Korea. And South Korea was poorer than many countries in Africa on a GDP basis. And so its achievement of going from a recipient of foreign assistance to a donor of foreign assistance now, a major donor, is unparalleled. And going from that level of poverty to being a member of the OECD is also unparalleled. So with that, and, and now Korea's got a per capita income that just actually set a record last year for exceeding uh, $30,000 per capita for the first time. So um, it's a remarkable story. Um, and with that development through the decades, um, trade as well as <coughs> the United States, uh, many, many fold. Um, and Evolved as all trading relationships do as countries develop. But just to go back really quickly, um, how did we get to 2.0? Uh, it's just starting with Chorus 1.0, and we've got an expert on that process right here in Troy who may touch on it, so I'm just going to go very briefly. But that agreement uh, was signed in the first uh, Chorus was signed in 2007. Um, with the intent of trying to uh, address some of the contentious issues that have been long standing between the two countries over steel, steel trade, auto trade, auto ac market access and autos, agriculture, intellectual property, and other issues. But everyone could see the potential for resolving those and moving ahead. The agreement was negotiated, signed in 2007, and then for reasons of, of, of politics in Washington, uh, President Bush was unable to submit the agreement to Congress. There was opposition from a number of major industry groups in the United States that the agreement didn't go far enough on market access, and it sat there for three years. Uh, then, uh, in 2010, uh, President Obama uh, decided to try to re Invigorate the negotiation and address the issues that had been lingering um, since 2007. And they were able to culminate an agreement that was signed in December 2010 that had broader industry backing um, by Ford and also the United Auto Workers. Um, and so they were able to have the Congress pass, pass legislation to enact chorus in 2011. And 2012. But with a lot of criticism as well, with groups saying it was going to continue to erode the U.S. manufacturing base, grow trade deficits, and result in 160,000 lost jobs. So as the agreement was implemented, starting in 2012, um, there was 
still a focus on the bilateral trade deficit with Korea. And just as a lot of critics said, um, the trade deficit started to increase in 2012. And by two, the first five years of the agreement, and, um, basically saw the trade deficit go from 13 billion uh, to 27 billion dollars in the goods deficit. And here I'm talking goods, but a lot of folks concentrate on goods. And U.S. exports of goods uh, have gone up a little bit at first, but remained absolutely flat. So after five years of tariffs being reduced substantially, right from day one of the agreement, um, at the end of the day, um, analysts looked at the trade and goods exports numbers and saw that it had barely increased, less, less than a billion dollars. So when President Trump came into office, he had been a big critic uh, of the agreement in the camp during the campaign, and came into office saying it was a horrible deal, and one that never should have been made. And then in April 2017, mentioned that maybe we should just terminate the agreement because it wasn't serving our interests. And basically, when you look Um, so anyway, um, in July of 2017, uh, literally within two weeks of a visit by President Moon, first one uh, from him to Washington, um, the, uh, President Trump instructed the U.S. Trade Representative, Bob Lighthizer, uh, to start negotiations with Korea uh, to solve this problem. Ambassador Lighthizer had been in his position about a week, and this was the first thing on his plate was to try to figure out what to do. Uh, so he uh, took the course of, uh, of not going to Congress to request authority to renegoti renegotiate the entire agreement, but he filed a request of course, uh, to, um, for a meeting of the Joint Committee under course, the Governing Committee for the Agreement, to meet uh, immediately to discuss the issues that the United States felt were not being properly implemented. So under that provision, there's, the Joint Committee is required to meet within 30 days. And so on August 22, 2017, uh, the first meeting to discuss chorus took place in Seoul. Um, and the intention was to adjust many provisions of chorus um, across the board, potentially freezing um, the um, phase out of tariffs on the United States side, um, possibly um, terminating the agreement Um, and adjusting a lot of regulatory issues that the administration felt remain barriers to U.S. exports and the reason why U.S. goods exports had not increased. So after that first contentious meeting, and I was in the meeting, so I can tell you that, um, there were uh, several other meetings, both formal and uh, less formal, try to get a framework for negotiation. Uh, and then uh, another, another meeting of the two delegations in Washington in, in um, February. And then very quickly, an agreement was announced at the end of March of 2018. And uh, surprised a lot of people that all of a sudden there had been agreement when there had been no consensus at all leading into that. And a lot of people were wondering, well, how could this be done so quickly? And what was happening at the time, if you remember, uh, that there were a few missiles flying around Northeast Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. I was living in Seoul, so it was a bit disconcerting. Um, and a lot of uh, concern about the security situation. About the security situation. Uh, and, the, and how working with our, our 
meet US um, automotive safety standards, FMVSS standards, but do not comply with the, the, with the similar Korean standard. So that, that number was in, increased from 25,000 units per year to 50,000 units. Uh, similarly, there were a, a change to allow um, tests that met US emissions certifications for vehicles would be accepted by the Korean um, Ministry of uh, 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 Land, Infrastructure, and Transport. Um, and there's a, a small volume exception for companies as well. And agreement on some very technical issues regarding uh, fleet uh, fuel efficiency standards that uh, were not were announced but not resolved during the agreement. There was also an agreement to extend the U.S. tariff on light trucks, which has been a fixture of U.S. trade policy since the 60s. But there is a tariff on, on light trucks coming into the U.S. of 25%, which basically prohibits or blocks, realistically, any light truck manufacturer overseas from coming into the U.S. That had been scheduled to phase out in 2021 under Chorus 1.0, but under the renegotiation, uh, it was agreed that it would be extended to 2041, another 20 years. Um, so that was a major change. There were also provisions on auto parts, uh, that replacement auto parts uh, for U.S. vehicles with <coughs> standards. There was a provision on pharmaceutical pricing and reimbursement, uh, which was a chapter in Chorus, where in the, agree in the agreement that Korea committed uh, that there'd be non-discrimination against foreign companies and also uh, to amend an existing regulation that did discriminate um, by the end of last year. And most notably for Korea, uh, at that time, you might remember that the Trump administration had announced that it was uh, had a policy to put tariffs of 25% on the import of steel from uh, every country in the world. And for Korea, that's one of their major export industries or, uh, to the United States. So as part of the side letter to that negotiation, uh, Korea uh, agreed to reduce its exports to 70% of its earlier volumes, and, would, and, that, and for doing that would be exempt from the 25% tariff the administration would have otherwise applied. And then lastly, there were uh, provisions on customs implementation, um, and which are um, uh, basically restating and but <laughs> Re-emphasizing some of the provisions that were in the original chorus agreement. So that's all pretty technical stuff. And so when we talk about chorus uh, FTA 2.0, that's basically just about everything what I just told you. So this is not a sweeping renegotiation, uh, although it's a <coughs> trade that way. Um, and it's not clear what the effect on trade But nonetheless, um, that's what was negotiated and held, as a, held up as a major change. Uh, I think, in my view, it's not a major change. But nonetheless, I think it's important to look at where Chorus pre-1.0 was and where we are now at Korea uh, Chorus post-2.0. And just to give you a, a sort of a quick summary of the changes since uh, March 2012, uh, when CORUS went into effect, um, only 14% of U.S. goods entering Korea went in duty-free. As of uh, January 1 this year, that number is 95%. And when the phase-in period for other categories is completed in 2022, it's going to be 99% of U.S. goods going to Korea will enter um, duty-free. Um, if you look at Korean uh, imp 
imports. From 2010 through 2018, Korean imports from the world by value declined 8.8%. And imports from the United States during that time frame increased 16.8%. Pre 1.0 market share of imports from American companies went from 8.5% uh, before, of course, went into effect. Uh, as of the end of last year, that number was 11% of Korean imports now come from the United States. And so that shift has meant that the United States has gone from being the fifth largest trading partner of Korea to being the second largest trading partner of Korea behind China. So those changes have taken place. And then the weighted average tariff for forest um, on U.S. goods is now 1.6%, whereas Korea's weighted average tariff with its WTO trading partners overall is 5.6%. So we have a real advantage there. So that's really what the effect of getting to Chorus 2.0 looks like in real trade, is that there have been a lot of changes um, that benefit U.S. companies and make the Korean market more, much more attractive pre-1.0 than where we are in a post-2.0 world. Now, as what has happened since the agreement was signed or went into effect at uh, the beginning of, uh, of, of, or since the agreement 2.0 was signed. Well, uh, by chance and by, by a lot of effort by companies, the bilateral deficit has rapidly declined. You, met, you recall I mentioned that uh, for five years the U.S. export of goods had remained flat. Well, since in the last two years, uh, that number has increased from $42 billion per year to last year um, reaching an all-time record high of $56.4 billion uh, uh, in U.S. exports, uh, which is you know, uh, almost a, third, a growth by a third in the last two years, uh, which is what people had actually been hoping for, I think, when the agreement was negotiated. So, um, a lot of that increase um, is due to the, the energy revolution in our country. And so Korea is the second largest importer of LNG from the United States uh, after Japan. Actually, it just dropped a third after Japan and China, but it's a very large in, uh, importer. And started taking shipments in uh, June of 2017. Co-gas, which is a, a, a state-owned ga gas company, has a 20-year contract already to import gas from uh, <coughs> from the Chenier terminal in Louisiana. So that number is going to stay large for many years, and there's going to be more coming. Similarly, there's been a big increase in uh, oil imports from the United States. It's a part of the shale revolution, and also of what we call liquefied propane gas which is now almost a $2 billion export uh, from the U.S. So the deficit now for goods uh, is about $17 billion last year. And if you look at the overall deficit on trade, including services, of which the United States uh, has always run a surplus, if you put those two together, as most economists do, the deficit last year with Korea was $5.8 you're looking at economies uh, that are the size of the United States, I think we're like 21, 22 trillion dollar economy. Korea, one, three, one, five. You know, so when you're talking about economies of that scale, the 5.8 billion dollar deficit is not something you want to base your policy around, in my view. But what you want to do with a large market like that is really focus on the opportunity That's 
not to say that there aren't issues out there. There are definitely trade issues out there. There are, uh, you know, we've got a lot of trade and a lot of companies selling sophisticated products. Uh, there are all, always going to be issues, and our trade negotiators uh, certainly have reasons to meet frequently, which they do. But um, it, it's, it shouldn't uh, overshadow the impact uh, of, of, the, of the agreement and the growth in trade. Now, when we're looking at Korea 2.0, well, what are we looking at? Because I think you know, we're looking at the market. It's really important to realize that the sort of manufacturing juggernaut that has kind of defined Korean growth since really the, 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 the late 70s you know, has been rapidly changing in the last few years. Korea is one of the most heavily trade-dependent countries in the world. Over 50% of its GDP rely on exports. Um, it's a, one of the most uh, manufacturing-dependent major economies in the world. And so this has been, these have been the drivers of growth uh, of, the, of the Korean economic miracle, uh, have been these fast-growing uh, manufacturing industries like autos, steel, petrochemical, uh, in recent years, obviously the last 20 years, electronics. These are the, have been the, and shipbuilding. And these have all been the drivers of growth for Korea. But if you spend time in Korea these days, you know <coughs> that a lot of those industries are not growing like they used to um, for a number of reasons. Um, for a number of the larger heavy industries, that reason, in my view, time there uh, is China. Um, a number of those industries are facing competition um, from state-owned Chinese enterprises, and particularly in, in shipbuilding, in steel, and in petrochemicals. The major competitor for Korea is um, our Chinese state-owned companies, um, and that has taken a toll on otherwise we're extremely competitive industries. Uh, for other industries, such as autos and electronics, uh, they increasingly have globalized and have moved a lot of their production elsewhere in the world. Um, auto industry, um, cost of production is quite high in Korea, so a lot of companies have moved uh, production to elsewhere, including uh, to the United States. And electronics, um, uh, Samsung and LG have moved a lot of their uh, smartphone and other production outside of, of Korea uh, to Vietnam and elsewhere. And I just read recently that LG is, is going to be phasing out smartphone production in Korea and will not be making smartphones there at all. So uh, the Korean economy has changed a lot. And so when you're looking at doing business in Korea, that old uh, paradigm that, that had been so strong for many years is rapidly changing. Um, and so in this 2.0 era, um, President Moon was elected two years ago. And in, in an interesting way, kind of came in as the jobs president, uh, trying to address some of the same issues that President Trump emphasized in his campaign. And uh, concern in Korea that uh, there was not enough job creation, and particularly for younger people, increasingly hard to find, get a get a foothold in, in the workforce and to build a career. And so Korea is scrambling to reinvent itself. And this it started even before President Moon under President Park. With her. She had something called the Creative Economy Initiative, where they were looking for ways to stimulate the growth. Of industries in Korea. President Moon uh, has something similar with a different name. Uh, basically, his focus of his, uh, his administration is the fourth industrial revolution, trying to make, bring Korean companies to take advantage of all the rapid changes in, uh, in technology uh, that are revolutionizing, revolutionizing production. I think that the one of the interesting things that he 
commenting is that uh, how we look at the Korea for the future um, as our economic and trading partner. So uh, he touched on that uh, demographic changes in Korea and also that uh, uh, countries focus a lot more on research and development and intellectual property rights that provide a lot of new opportunities for the American companies to tap into. Um, so at this moment, I'd like to introduce that uh, uh, the panelists, the rest of the panelists, uh, so that uh, each of them has an opportunity to uh, either reflect upon that there, what uh, he talks about, and also that uh, how the course FTA 2.0 will have an impact your own business. I know that the Troy is uh, represented uh, think tank, KEI, um, but the two other gentlemen, that they, they are practitioners, so uh, they've been following this trend uh, for many, many years. So let me just briefly introduce uh, each panelist, uh, then I'll ask uh, each of them to talk about uh, what their perspective on this uh, the modification of course FDA and how they predict that uh, it will affect their businesses. So next to David, uh, it's Mr. Troy Stengren. And actually, that, uh, as David mentioned, that the Troy was uh, our uh, guest speaker seven years ago when the original um, Corus FTA was uh, launched. So he knows a lot of detail, the history and background about uh, why that, that we signed the deal. One of the things I still remember he talked about, it was actually the Korea he uh, approached the US. It is not the US that who were terribly interested in signing the bilateral free trade agreement with Korea. <coughs> so the Troy is the senior director of the Congregational Affairs and Trade at Korea Economic Institute. He oversees KEI's uh, trade and economic related initiatives as well as with the Institute's uh, relationship with Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Uh, Troy, uh, before he joined the KEI, he worked on the Capitol Hill for Senator Robert um, Trosselli, uh, Trosselli and on issues related to foreign affairs and trade. To his right, um, we all know that uh, he's a chair of the Global uh, Trade Week sponsored by the LA Chamber of Commerce. So some of us actually attended the kickoff breakfast in the building, actually, that David mentioned that, uh, uh, this morning. Um, so uh, Vince Iacopella, uh, he's the Executive Vice President for Alba Wheels of International Inc. His responsibilities include leading Alba's expansion into new markets and including the portfolio of the product offerings with focuses on trade sensitive imports and exports, as well as the smart supply chain technologies that drive the value to importers and exporters with trade sensitive uh, shipments. Uh, he has served at uh, uh, multiple organizations. Uh, the most recently, Vince was the president of the Pacific Coast Council, LA Vice Chair of the e, uh, DECSC. <coughs> District Export Council of uh, Southern California, that's the acronym of the DCSC, and past co-chair of the Federal Advisory Committee of Commercial Operations for Customs and uh, Border Protection. <coughs> and uh, the gentleman to his right, that uh, far my right, uh, Mr. Lincoln Lee, uh, he's a director of international development at Doma Athletics, um, uh, Beverly Hills. He began his career as a financial manager in 2001, leading him to Asia, where he worked as a director of the operations, negotiating contracts, and leading marketing in China, Korea, Vietnam, and Japan. Before he joined this company, uh, Mr. Lee, he worked for various legal financial institutions in the private sector <coughs> and investment banking industry, and also the Minister of the Legislation of the Republic of Korea. Uh, he has a BA degree in business economics from the University of California, San Barbara, and an MBA with an emphasis in international business from Cal State uh, Northridge. He also has an executive certification from the Thunderbird School of Business uh, and a JD and LLM from the University of San Diego. Okay. So at this moment, um, may I ask the Troy, 
Um, <coughs> you kind of represent the uh, people in the Capitol Hill, and you work very closely with um, our senators and congressmen. Um, why do you think that they're, they kind of supported this particular deal, and then what are some of the major changes you expect uh, out of this particular deal? Do you mean uh, the original deal while Capitol supported in the vote, or uh, more specifically? More specifically, the reason yeah. the two votes are shared. So, as you know, David mentioned, uh, you actually, under the revisions, of course, uh, didn't have to go to Congress, so we were able to do this basically through administrative procedures. Um, much of Capitol Hill's perspective, though, was focused on maintaining the agreement and maintaining the alliance. David spoke early in his remarks about this intersection between um, security and economics with South Korea. And one of the things, you know, this question of how does it directly affect you? Has it, someone who works at a think tank, this directly affected me on Labor Day weekend of 2017. Uh, I don't know how many of you all know, uh, President Trump was set to withdraw from the course FTA um, that weekend. He was gonna, on Tuesday, uh, come in and do that. I spent my Saturday that weekend writing all the reasons why we shouldn't do this. And uh, about the time I was about to go to bed around 11.30, one of my colleagues texted me, she's like, oh, did you see North Korea just tested a nuclear weapon? <laughs> so all of this kind of came to a head the same weekend. But on Capitol Hill, there's a very strong relationship with South Korea. Um, I'm sure many of you are all familiar with Congressman Ed Royce, who recently retired as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, strong opponent of relations with Korea. Uh, so you have these deep ties now with Georgia, Alabama, with the Hyundai and Kia plants, Texas with the <coughs> semiconductor plant. So there's strong connections on Capitol Hill for business reasons, for geopolitical reasons, uh, to maintain the relationship, and that's really where we are going forward. I think what Capitol members on the Hill would like to see them, and this is the frustration that I think we've had sort of with this agreement. Anytime you have an agreement come into place, you're going to have people in the beginning who say, this is going to be wonderful, and those who say, this is going to be horrible. The challenge was with, of course, FDA, things didn't go the way anyone expected. If you look at the ITC report, um, they expected South Korean exports to the United States to increase by about $6 uh, billion. U.S. exports, though, were supposed to climb over the implementation period by about 9.7 to 10.6 billion. The challenge that we faced was sort of twofold. One, as David mentioned in the beginning, basically U.S. exports flatlined. They actually went down um, after course was implemented, so it wasn't even a question of they didn't go up, but you had this struggle of how do you take and grow these exports out of the FTA when Korea's imports to the U.S. are growing, but U.S. exports are going down. Now, there's some tactical reasons why that happened, and some of this still applies today. If you look at agriculture, for example, um, we export more corn, and wheat and things to South Korea than we did before chorus in volume. But because, as you all know, agricultural commodity prices tend to fluctuate fairly large uh, bands, those products also went down. They were sort of at high prices just before chorus, and now they're cheaper. So we're exporting more overall, but in terms of the actual value, it's only about the same as before, in some cases less. So you have these challenges. Um, but. You know, if you were to look at this, and let's say you were to use the sort of traditional means that people say, just look at the headline numbers and that proves your case or does disproves your case. We actually, you know, the ICT report's basically around full implementation, but that's largely meant within 10 years because there are only a few items that went beyond that. So right now, exports to South Korea are up over $13 billion from pre-chorus. So you'd say, chorus has done its job, it succeeded, it worked. This is all prior to the revisions. Course is a success. If you get a little bit more nuanced look at this, $8.6 billion of that is in either LNG, oil, or other basically fossil fuel exports to South Korea. The ITC report, I looked at it last night to make sure that I had this right, um, doesn't take and actually account for a change in those exports. So you can't really attribute the ITC estimate to that. Um, now that being said, we should have figured that this would go up some because prior to the U.S. lifting the ban on refined oil exports uh, around the world, um, FTA partners were allowed to import them. It was the one sort of exception to the ban and everything. 
imports. So we should have expected that Korea would have imported more through the U.S. for its own diversification points because one of the things that uh, keep in mind is that there are no real domestic energy resources in South Korea. Even for the nuclear power plants, they have to import uh, the fuel from the nuclear suppliers group to take and run the nuclear power plants. So everything is basically you know, imported into South Korea. But we had challenges not just because you had issues dealing with you know, changing the commodity prices or other things. Some of it was there were implementation issues. There always are. But uh, a colleague of mine on Capitol Hill was rather blunt and said that they felt that there were more implementation issues than with all of our other MTA partners combined. Probably an exaggeration, but one well, of the challenges. And I like orange juice, so I drank orange juice this morning. And how many of you all have a bottle of orange juice in front of you? All right, so only maybe one other person, uh, two. If you look at the back of this bottle of orange juice, you'll notice it says, contains concentrates from US and Brazil. So one of, I'm just giving this as an example of some of the regulatory challenges we face. For um, concentrated orange juice, the tariff is supposed to go away. Suddenly, the Customs Authority started denying the tariff reduction. And they had a reason. They're like, someone in Korea came to the US, they looked at the black of the bottle, they're like, oh, it says Brazil and US. It's only supposed to be US oranges that get the exemption, therefore, these are not uh, eligible. So USCR went through the process, bringing their teams over from the Customs Authority, showing that, listen, here's the facility, here is the co-mingled, here is the only U.S. orange juice. We're only shipping you the only U.S. You need to reapply this. You think it would be done right away? It still took a few months after that to actually get this process moving in. So you had these types of issues. Now we worked through a lot of them, and I was in Korea about a month ago, and I met with um, the deputy minister at the Ministry for Trade, Industry, and Energy, and you know their clear message was, we don't want any trade frictions with the United States. We want things to go well. So you know, hopefully we're at a point now to where the government really wants to, if there are problems, businesses are facing, try and find a way to work through them and work through them expeditiously and everything. But you know, so these were the challenges. But the good news is, is partially because of LNG, partially because of growth and other exports, you know, we now have seen the, some of the trade reduction that we thought we were going to see and the growth in exports. Um, and I know you only want us to do five minutes, so I just want to touch really quick on sort of three trends, two of which David already talked about, mm -hmm. um, in terms of you know, where I see actual opportunities growing. You know, one, David mentioned the demographic change. You know, we all know that you know, Japan is aging. We know that a lot of the European countries are aging. We know the US is aging, but slower than the others. Korea is much more drastic in terms of the aging demographic happening. Within two decades, 30% of the population is going to be over the age of 65. You're going to see a significant decrease in the working age population. It's already started to decline. Um, the worst case scenario is that it could be cut in half within two decades. Most likely, you'll lose about seven and a half million people. So you're going to see changes within South Korean society, within STEM graphics in terms of the working age population. This has implications for US business, one in terms of you know, clearly healthcare and Industries dealing with the re retirees are going to be things where Korea is going to be looking for a lot of help. But it also has implications for defense contractors. And we were passing by Raytheon last night, and I was thinking about this. South Korea is going to have to reform its military. It's going to have to move to more tech-heavy type military to take and maintain its ability to defend against North Korea, to <coughs> deal with forces in China. So there are opportunities there for U.S. defense contractors who can bring in higher technology equipment. And South Korea is looking to buy more U.S. defense uh, supplies. So there's a lot of shifts that are going to be related to demographics that U.S. companies have an opportunity to work with Korean companies on. Another um, is right now, I don't know how many of you all know what PM 2.5 is or fine dust, but basically they're very fine particles. Some of them, like the spray from the ocean when the water hits up, is considered 2.5 because it's how small the actual water pellets are. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, anything that comes from a lot of industrial goods, car exhaust, fits into this. And because of pollution from China, because of domestic pollution, it's actually become very, very bad in South Korea. It's an electoral issue now. Um, the government is looking for ways to resolve this. They're investing significantly in trying to develop hydrogen fuel cell technology to take and basically move all of their vehicles off of emissions 
So you're going to see they haven't set like France and the UK or China to a lesser extent an idea of when they want to fail the combustion engine, but you can sort of see the handwriting on the wall for environmental reasons. And it's bad. I've never really thought about wearing a mask when I go to South Korea, but uh, one of my recent trips, I seriously thought about doing it. I could feel the particles in my eyes. Um, so environmentally friendly technology and everything, I think is going to be a big area going forward in South Korea. And the last one I just want to touch on really briefly is, you know, I want to emphasize this direct export idea. Uh, middlemen in South Korea tend to mark things up a lot. People are willing to pay customs duties to buy Samsung TVs off of Amazon in the U.S. and ship to Korea and pay the duty because it's still cheaper. Um, so, you know, if you have a product that you think you can market to Korean consumers, there might be a way to actually do it directly. You might want to look into it because it might actually be cheaper than going through the process of using distributors in South Korea. expert on this particular issue, so can you just elaborate on that aspect and explain that uh, what have been the long-term sort of standing concerns with regard to the procedures for inspection and verification of the uh, origin of the export required? Sure, and I think I can give you a good picture in under five minutes, so... Um, you can take ten minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, being local, uh, when I first came to Los Angeles in 87, I spent 15 years managing textile imports from Korea to um, US-based companies that were still cutting and sewing in Los Angeles or apparel. So my first 10, 15 years in, was with really dealing with imports from Korea. And then in the late 90s, we saw a lot of, uh, especially up in the northern San Fernando Valley, Valley the Chatsworth area, we saw a lot of companies in the tech sector, which is very aligned with uh, the comments that were made previously about the high value tech-related exports from the US to Korea. So we started seeing things like data storage machines uh, that were very complicated that could only be made in Southern California. Um, and obviously, uh, as opposed to consumer products, um, for those companies did not have to compete globally, globally at the level that uh, those companies that were exporting consumer products might have had to compete. Um, so that was my, my, my experience, and still is, uh, managing mostly tech-related exports from Southern California to Korea. I do remember uh, at the beginning of the agreement, LAEDC and all the local chambers did a great job of um, putting together numbers for the, the microeconomy of, of Los Angeles and LA County, which was immediately going to benefit tremendously, uh, not only from manufacturing, but from trade-related services. Mm -hmm. So it, here in LA, we, for us in Los Angeles, we always knew it was a winner. Um, at the time, uh, those of us in the trade locally felt that um, it should not have been as controversial as it was because it wasn't TPP. It wasn't. It wasn't this sweeping exchange. It was kind of like a kind of like a no-brainer um, that it was a kind of like a win-win for everyone. That was pretty obvious. Um, leading up to 2.0, um, and I, I loved the earlier comments and, and the, the description of how it evolved. Leading up to 2.0, um, those of us that are so involved in China, which is like 70% of my time, were really surprised that Southern Korea was actually on the radar for trade, um, considering the, the, the challenges uh, perceived, imagined, and real um, that we're dealing with with China. So. Um, you know, we were watching it very closely, but I have to say this before we talk about 2.0. At a transactional level, the two things in, a, in any privileged trade agreement that we see at a transactional level are soft trade barriers and proof of origin, right? So uh, one thing we didn't see in Korea, like we saw in other countries, even ones that aren't privileged, like Brazil, is we didn't have this elaborate import permit system. So we didn't have this elaborate import license system where, um, okay, we're gonna sign this free trade agreement, but you have to do all these things to prove origin, right? Or um, 
you know, your import permit um, doesn't have the ink, doesn't have the dot after the INC. I'm serious that these are real things that get bounced back. So um, we didn't see any of that operation. We, we saw a very cooperative uh, trade and a very cooperative government that was not trying to sign an agreement and then deny access to the, to the market. Uh, our customers didn't see that at all. So um, when, when 2.0 came around, um, we were a bit surprised. Uh, and uh, the agreement was reached uh, on, the, on the automobiles. And I, I believe that Korea agreed to cap steel uh, exports to the United States. Um, but even before that, is anybody from Customs and Border Protection here? No? I would say it anyway, if they were. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, those of you who know me, so I would say it anyway. Uh, C so CBP and DHS, being on the COAC, um, they were kind of scratching their heads as well because um, even this was, you know, when we announced the, the, the 301 tariffs against China, um, there was a massive enforcement investment that took place at DHS and CBP to prove origin, to prove that you know things that were suddenly being made in Taiwan that used to be made in China were really made in Taiwan and not still made in China. And then there was this also uh, massive enforcement investment, which we still really haven't seen the full effect of, uh, for US importers that um, may, may get creative on classification, right? To, to see if something done was two or was three. So even the other agencies that have to enforce trade policy, we're not focused on Korea. We're not really not focused on heavy enforcement for Korea. So that was a great, um, I think that was a great uh, outcome with 2.0, uh, that that was negotiated. But even before that was negotiated, um, none of us in the trade, at a transactional level, saw this huge focus on, on the Korean imports. So um, if I had to call out, uh, for those of you that might be new to export, those of you that are very, very experienced, if I have to call out the two things to, to look at going forward, um, there will always be a burden to prove origin to be eligible for the preference program. And uh, in the tech environment, you have to um, be sensitive to the fact that there are State Department licenses and DOD licenses that could restrict your tech export, right? Uh, looking at John, John's not a he, he might know better than anybody else. Um, so um, with that, uh, that, that's been our experience. Those are, I think if you check those two boxes, um, I think you could have a, a pretty, as compared to other markets, even countries that we have FTA agreements with, I think you could have a relatively uh, successful um, uh, shot in Korea with American goods, American origin goods being distributed in Korea, um, and uh, those, sticking in those lanes and getting the right professionals around you, the right attorneys, the right brokers, the right forwarders, Maybe the right distributor, maybe not. Maybe not a distributor. Uh, so, uh, but that's just my take on what we're seeing on everyday transactions from the U.S. to Korea. Okay, thanks, Vince. <coughs> Lincoln. <coughs> when David uh, he talks about uh, steel, there's uh, there a lot of consumers uh, in Korea, so we can sell our products despite the fact that the Korean profile of the economy is changing from the manufacturing power to more uh, technology-oriented research and development and FDI and et cetera. And also, uh, <coughs> Troy and also the David talks about the change in the demographics. The products you're dealing with uh, is a skincare product. Uh, so one of the, I think they're very appealing to consumer goods in, in Korea. So. Uh, could you share with us that uh, how your business has been so successful? Um, did you take all these what, uh, factors into consideration when you're trying to actually uh, serve the market, uh, both in terms of the products and then you also have a kind of facilities and then sure. uh, to provide all these what, uh, skincare service? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much do I have? I got five minutes? Uh, no, you have more than five minutes. I got more than five minutes? <laughs> all right, so I'm, uh, 
I'm very grateful because you guys, everyone spoke here about the macroeconomics of Korea. I get to talk about the microeconomics and sort of how everything's sort of coming to play. And there's a lot of good insight from a macro point of view of what you know David and Troy and Vincent have said. And I'll, real quick, I just want to touch upon some of those things because it actually plays into what we do. So first, we'll go with the question. Um, being a high-end luxury, I think uh, what it comes down to is any international commerce comes down to localization of a product, right? There's always going to be a supply and demand. You need to localize. And if you understand the Korean economy or Korean mentality of the market, high-end luxury goods are favorable because it's a status symbol. That's why Mercedes and BMW invest so heavily in Audi so much. Their, their exports are huge in Korea, even though it's a tiny country, right? Uh, so what we did for Dermasthetics, I've been with this company, it's actually a family company, we've been manufacturing skincare for about 40 years. Um, that company has been, we targeted specifically dermatologists and the professional skincare industry, and we focused within that lane. We didn't go mass market where we commercialized, we stuck to a niche market, and we kept, kept that high-end luxury brand appeal. And so when you know, even during recessions and things like that, during IMF in 97, we've been there for about 30 years as a, as a company, as a brand. And so when IMF hit, we, it's sort of a somewhat recession-proof industry. And the way we sort of, the way we sort of, if you look at how we've sort of implemented ourselves, we made ourselves indisposable to the aesthetics or the beauty market because we provide the treatments and skincare products that they need to run their services. And so with that, combined with the high, uh, you know, of course we could have higher multipliers if we went straight D to C, direct to consumer, especially with the economic or the technology boom and e-commerce, but we chose not to, we probably chose to make our product more exclusive and kept that niche. So we're not max maximizing our market cap, but we're keeping it sort of somewhat stable and steady, and we create that exclusivity. Now, that's in a luxury high-end market, but there's a lot of different, I mean, Coming from, speaking from a macro point of view to a micro, everything is industry specific. And I think Troy brought up a super <clears throat> important thing about uh, direct to consumer shipping from here and how we can leverage the shipping costs that are more affordable. So it circumvents, you know, trade in Vincent's company, but it's actually more profitable. And what we're doing is, what you're seeing is, you're seeing a hybrid of what China has done and what Singapore is doing. Uh, because, and I think that, one of the biggest missed opportunities for Korea uh, and the U.S. or for Korea was that before China had the free trade zones and the you know importing through, they were importing straight from Hong Kong. And what a lot of people were doing, some savvy business people were doing, was they were exporting to Korea from 12 to 17. And I think, uh, on a side note, one of the reasons why I think you know we saw a less of a trade rise was because in 2010, 2012, Alibaba and WeChat started to rise. And that's when we saw a lot of flashback, right? Uh, now with that said, there was a big missed opportunity because Korea always served as a conduit to China for a lot of American companies. And we, we didn't capitalize on that. And I think that with FK, we could have, there was a bigger opportunity that we could have actually run with in multiple sectors or multiple industries. Um, going to the website though, there's a lot of companies now that are doing straight uh, direct to consumer and these websites will actually hire, what you do is Koreans or you know people in Korea will hire somebody here to go purchase certain products with the receipt and ship it to them for a service, like a 10% service fee or whatever. Um, and there are definitely like a ton of Korean companies, because I not only deal with high-end skincare but just in the beauty sector, but also in investments in startups as well. And what you see, what I'm seeing is that you're seeing a lot of these uh, individuals buying lot, like foreclosed lot sales on pallets and like uh, discarded trade, like you know, stuck in customs or just released and auctioned off items. They're all going to Korea and then they're going to Korea and straight back to China. And so there's a lot of missed opportunity there too. So I think that, you know, with Korea, and everybody sort of recognizes this, that. Korea is, they're not an asset-based product. It has, they're converting to a system or service base, which is the rise of like KU upon Eminem and CJ's property rights and videos, because they're just streaming it on VOD or whatever. And there's a lot of money that was just 
fell to the wayside because the Korean government couldn't really have a good relationship to reinforce the intellectual property that, or the, the trademark or intellectual property infringements that occurred. So, um, you know, I think that as we look at Korea, I view Korea more as like a baby Singapore. Uh, it's like a, it's because of the dying and aging population. Singapore is lucky because they have Malaysia and they have great trade, you know, but the government there is still unstable and shaky. There's a lot of like bribery, I don't know, call it what you will. Um, but, you know, perhaps Korea could do something with North Korea. Um, but working, I, I was just talking earlier with working with different politics and the geopolitical climate of everything, you know, it, it has to be done tactfully. But there is opportunity. Um, and I don't think that there's a right or wrong way. It's just sort of how you pivot, the, pivot with the, you know, the waves that come for, for Korea. May I, may I just follow sure. up, please? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree with him. Uh, he, he hit it on the DTC aspect. Yeah. You know, so um, the direct-to-consumer that was described as being purchased here and going directly, if you go to the, w, the World Trade Organization, there is a less of, much less of under it called WCO, which is the World Customs Organization. While I was in the COAC, we interfaced with them quite a bit. So one of the biggest challenges on DTC or direct-to-consumer right now into this country and into other developed countries is how do you not stifle all that creativity and all that opportunity of bypassing distributors? Um, and our companies are not invested. Uh, we were for four decades invested in the distributor model but many of us, including my company, have a DTC product. Uh, we have a direct-to-consumer assist product for, because we see the writing on the wall, right? So one of the challenges, several challenges with the DTC is this. Um, you don't want to stifle that energy and that access to the market, but you still have the traditional product safety issues. So you have cosmetics that have to be approved by the FDA equivalent in that local country. You have the IP issues that you mentioned, that there may be a Nike distributor in, in South Korea that may not like the fact that there are Nikes you know, being, coming into direct to consumer. Um, and the tech side, our customers are concerned on the DTC that technology that they own, um, it, 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 it could be getting into their, distribu their legal distribution area. But where I agree with, with Lincoln is that it's not a reason not to do it. It's a reason to beef up your partnerships and to do it correctly. And especially with, 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 with dermatology, I'll use the analogy of something coming into the country, right? Um, if you buy great market goods that were made by Colgate in Singapore and it's labeled for Canadian FDA, it's exactly the same toothpaste that we have in the United States, but it is not legal because it is not labeled for US FDA standards. So I think the next discussion is not going to be how do we discontinue DTC or direct to consumer, just how to do it in a better way, you know, how to do it in a framework. I, many of us would like a global standard, you know, where um, I know it's a dirty word right now, but, but, but many of us would like a global standard. To, so that companies, um, at, at least companies that are a certain level of development, um, could agree on data sets and agree on a global, you know, that's, we're a long way off. Um, but there's, there's option two, right? Option two is a privileged program for countries and companies that voluntarily participate, right? That are not mandated to participate, in which we can create a market where the DTC is, we could be safer for consumers. So I just wanted to throw that out there, that many, many traditional companies are, are, are pivoting to offer a direct-to-consumer product, including ours. Um, but then as we go along that path, we just have to be mindful of the challenges that might, that might come from there. Yeah, I, okay. I, not to dissuade you know, going and setting up a proper registration for certain products and things that with Korea. It, you, I, think, I definitely think that you do need a presence there, whether it be a service base, like having your website developers, because again, it's all about localization. And so you need to have that. At the same time, uh, one of the things that we've faced recently, 
is because with the just the economic climate and the government structure in Korea in the past year and a half, uh, with President Moon taking office, the KFDA has come down really hard on so importing products all good, regulation, lot numbers, everything, tracing the products, doing uh, holding restrictions. Like we work with a candle manufacturer out of Thailand, and I do work with from Thailand to Korea as well. Uh, I mean, the regulations are ridiculously, uh, sometimes illogical. And like the fines just keep adding, but these are literally paper pushers that they don't, you ask them why is this happening and they don't understand. It's extremely frustrating. And so they had to do a huge recall on E-Mart, which is like the Walmart of Korea, right? Uh, so they, I think they brought, we had to bring back almost 500,000 in inventory from E-Mart. And then the manufacturer had to replace everything, which they did, but it was, they could easily resell it because it's not a perishable item, it's a candle. But they did it, but we lost in a few hundred thousand dollars, like uh, almost a hundred thousand in shipping costs, right? And, and just bad image. So it's just a headache. But that, importing the product is one step, but that regulation and finding, you know, the government auditors of KFD coming in, and it, it's definitely gotten worse. I'll tell you that. It's definitely gotten a lot more scrutinizing. Uh, but with that said, I definitely think it's necessary because with a company, customer services, you know, Koreans, even in Korean or in Asia, everyone wants things now. So some people aren't willing to wait. Or if they feel like that product's not available readily in Korea, then there must be something wrong with it or they must not have the proper documentation or they won't trust it. So there's a lot of things, that, there's a lot of issues or factors that go into selling a product. Having a home base or having, we have a foreign legal company or a foreign investment company in Korea, a couple of them, that do operate this way, um, and it, it's good, um, but you know you need the whole you need the whole spectrum and to provide a fulfilled customer service aspect, right? So I always analogize it to like you know which drink got you for well you know which shot of whiskey got you drunk first yeah, it, all or the latter, right? <laughs> you, you just need the whole spectrum. Well, we talked about Korea, we cannot skip the discussion about travels. And uh, even though some of you mentioned about e-commerce and uh, Korean consumers, they want to purchase directly using the, you know, the template uh, already existing. But I think to some companies, it's almost inevitable. Uh, they have to set up some kind of what uh, distribution channels in order to get access uh, to the consumers. So, what do you think about the, some of these challenges? And then, if uh, any of the companies you're aware of that they're really struggling with this, what uh, setting up the right channels of distribution, and uh, they encounter some you know, most difficulties because of the chebos, because uh, you know, yeah. perception is that um, they're all over the places, and then unless you work with them, it's virtually impossible to what introduce your product to the Korean market. It is, because what you see is you see the rise of Chebos actually capitalizing, because they, they're, what they're doing is they're collapsing the vertical of the channels, mm -hmm. the supply chains, and they're actually hitting all the distributorships too. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting a little bit more difficult, but what they're looking for is they're, uh, so there's a Hong Kong company that does this really well, right? So the company's called Sasa, it's a publicly traded company. And what they do is they'll have like, like Le Mer, or something really famous, some expensive brand like Chanel and then they'll make a knockoff and the brand position right next to it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, that's what the goal is for these channels. And so it's becoming definitely a lot tighter. Um, one of the things I see that, you know, it, with that said, it's hard for smaller companies to enter, the, enter Korea, but if you have a bigger brand or you have a well-known brand and you incubate that brand as a well-received uh, brand in the US, that credibility plays a lot and it influences a lot into Korea as well. And so it overlaps because Korea is more, South Korea is more of like a hybrid nation of Western and Eastern. It's the yin and yang. It's like the, it is an entry point for Asia. It's a gateway. I, I, I do see that. And uh, you know, I think that there's definitely more opportunities for Korea to assimilate to a global, global economy, but uh, it definitely still is and does have does have some legs to be that. Um, one of the things I think that the Korean Chebos and brands have to realize and have a fine balance on is uh, 
this is talking specifically about microeconomics, marketing strategy, is you forget, a lot of companies forget, they confuse promotion and a brand. Because sometimes these chevos, what they're, they're so big, what they do is they'll flood the market with like, buy one, get one free, or buy one, get three free, or whatever, <laughs> and they flood the market, and they just say, if we get these people to subscribe and use it three times or four times, then it becomes a household good, and we, we convert, and that's the assumption. But a lot of these companies, even in Korea, you see companies in like coffee shops, and like restaurants, and shops, everywhere, they rise, and in six months, they're gone. And because they consider, they run, a, they run the brand like it's a promotion. A promotional product doesn't build a brand. A brand is its own entity and it survives and it grows and grows and grows. Promotions, and there's a fine line that we have to sort of, as business people, we have to walk. And I think Koreans sort of skew that line because it's such a fierce competitive market. And I, I mentioned before, Korea is really a beta testing ground for a lot of, a lot of brands and a lot of products that we pre-launch. And so, uh, in order to you know, in order to work against these chevos, it's inevitable that you're going to have to work with them one way or another. Whether it's on home shopping to dump your products, uh, whether it's you know through these out like these new drug shops uh, or drug stores like um, LHB or you know, uh, it's a big one. It's slipping my mind. The, the no, the uh, they they do it. It's the it's the Sephora. Olive, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Orange and green, yeah. All of you. Yeah. Thank you. So, but, you know, you have to, I mean, but, again, by sector, you just really have to realize what you're working with. And you're competing with China. And, like, you know, China has so many, we can't, Americans can't compete on that low bargain product. We have to create that niche in front of it. Yeah, we have to, and we have to establish ourselves as a luxury or high-end or mid to medium price product because we have to have that, and we have to reinforce it with that. Just to sort of reinforce this, I know this came up earlier with autos, and you know, Lincoln mentioned how BMW and Mercedes do well. They actually do really well in the Korean market, and U.S. automakers tend to not, and it's because of this whole luxury idea. I mean, most of the foreign auto sales in South Korea are luxury vehicles, and let's be honest, Americans don't buy uh, American luxury vehicles. You know, most people don't buy a They buy a BMW and Mercedes, you know, an Audi or something of that nature. Uh, but so I have a little bit more experience dealing with some people in the restaurant industry because I've had a chance to talk to some of them. Like about five years ago, I was talking with the execs at Outback. And so maybe the position is slightly outdated, but at the time, Korea was their biggest foreign market. And what they said was, you know, it was a real struggle, but they had a committed partner who believed in the Outback brand there and wanted to make it work. And they had to, but what they had to do, their Korean partner had to figure out how do you take and Koreanize Outback to make it a Korean restaurant. So, you know, I mean, some of this is a simplistic thing of like, if you're running a restaurant, you better have kimchi, you know, on your menu somewhere. But finding out how to match the tastes for the local market and having that committed partner who believes in your brand there to work with you. In this case, I don't think this was a chain wall. It was somebody who's more like medium sized, everything. But you still, you need that person to help you kind of really navigate the market. Just bottle of red wine in Korea is above 40,000 Korean won, which is uh, enormous 40 bucks. So they talked about status and prestige and then uh, whatever product they consume. Um, so I think that the Toyota, uh, they tested their um, uh, ES350 model in, in, in Korean market, and, um, somebody told me. And uh, all these sort of the luxurious models that they, they think is uh, Korea is a good place to test before they launch to the you know, rest of the world. Well, it's uh, 10.45, so we have a relatively small number of people. It's been almost two hours, so if you take a look at the program, that we're supposed to have a break, about 15 minutes. So would you like to take a break or you want to continue? I know some of you are anxious to ask your own questions, so I'd like to give you an option. Maurice, any questions you can say? Because I don't want to lose some of you. <laughs> <laughs> After we're taking a break, so. Shall we just continue? Maybe wrap up a, a little bit early? Okay, good. 
So at this point, I'd like to uh, open up to the floor. So um, I know some of you are really serious about uh, selling or uh, investing in Korea, and then we have our anchors, and then so now that you listen to these uh, experts, so uh, please feel free to raise any questions that you think that they uh, are help you to understand the market or anything. So please. Starting. Um, I think you started um, the session by uh, Trump uh, observing that we have a um, terrible trade deficit in Korea, therefore, ergo, uh, it must be that crappy old uh, Obama uh, world's worst trade agreement that I'm going to replace with the, my world's greatest trade agreement. Uh, my opinion is there's very little cause effect of a uh, trade agreement with the levels of trade. Let me explain. If, if you looked at the, what are the most important causes of higher or lower trade levels, tariffs to me would be the least likely. You start with, is the target economy growing, macroeconomic growth? If it's growing, demand will increase from everybody, and imports from the US will increase along with everybody else. And if it's not growing, it will be stagnant or, or lower. Other factors that were mentioned are the impact on uh, prices of the commodities. You said uh, we got a spike in agricultural prices, therefore there was an increase. Uh, somebody mentioned that we had a spike in, they had a spike in the need for energy products, so there was also a, a large increase, having nothing to do with the tariffs. Um, and, uh, so, so there are so many other factors other than, not that trade agreements are no good, I mean, it's, it's good to have lower tariffs. But if we really want to talk about how we're going to increase exports, let's say to Korea or any, anybody, uh, most of those factors are beyond our control. We can't control how fast the economies are growing. We can't uh, control exchange rates very well. We can't uh, control commodity prices. Uh, we can't control whether there's a huge spike in need for aircraft sale or, or this. What we can control is, uh, is uh, whether our, uh, we are uh, promoting U.S. exports uh, or helping uh, American exporters take advantage of the many opportunities that you talked about. And the fact is that very few American companies are participating in export trade. 75% of our manufacturers are not, which is why I'm involved in the Milken Institute new export initiative, which is to say if we get more companies over the hump of not exporting and getting into exporting, then they can take advantage of the macroeconomic and other uh, opportunities in, in these foreign countries. So to me, uh, trade agreement is too simplistic uh, uh, an approach, and there's no way to really correlate trade levels with, uh, with tariff levels. So that's just a general comment. It's not a panacea, and I, and I don't like to see us approach these things as trade agreements as a solution to to uh, all of our trade problems. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I agree with you, and I think that's why I, I kind of mentioned that the FTA, the CORE's FTA, um, you know, basically did what it could, and that is it can remove certain impediments at the margins, you know, such as tariffs. have some impact on sales, but it's a marginal impact. Obviously, a 25% than a two, yeah. So you know, at the margins, and this, you know, as I mentioned, this FTA, you know, at this point has eliminated 95 percent of, of the tariffs. So that's the environment is a, is a little more open. What happens to it, you know, has a lot of other exogenous factors that folks can't control. Like you mentioned, you know, you, know, you want to sell to a growing economy. You know, if an economy. some opportunity, hopefully, 
uh, you know, on the regulatory side makes processes a little more transparent, which some FTAs have those kind of provisions, but you know, it's not a panacea. And at the end of the day, it's about your product, about localizing it, about getting companies, uh, having products that are tailored to consumers or needs in other countries. And that's why the organization that I just retired from, I'm really proud of spending my career in, Julianne uh, Hennessy is our you know, representative uh, from the U.S. Department of Commerce Export Assistance Center is, is because they're focused on trying to help companies one by one identify market opportunities, understand the markets, meet people who might be interested in buying their product or importing or adapting it, and doing that all over the world. So, you know, it's not, it's not a sign a piece of paper on a trade agreement and you solve problems, but it's that kind of everyday hard work that is slowly building our export base. Yeah. I was just going to add real quick. You know, on energy, you know, because of our own sort of going back, you know, to the 70s rules in place, we had taken ourselves out of that market anyway, so now you're seeing that sort of being reestablished. Uh, where tariffs, and you know, you mentioned prohibitive, but it also, it's a relativistic thing in the sense of that, um, you know, if Korea has a tariff on beef, which they do, uh, and Australia has an FTA, which eliminates it, and it's a 45% tariff, and we don't have an FTA with Korea, we're gonna lose a lot of that market share because you're playing a different game, so it's that equalization that matters. And the counterverse of that is, you know, this is where on the 232 on steel, it's looking like Korea made the wrong choice, perhaps, maybe, to take the deal on the quota because they don't face a tariff, but they're capped on what they can export to where, because there's only a few other countries who are largely minor players who took the deal, essentially the market is now just stabilized at 25% more, and so everybody exports more, and it's essentially the same, just everybody's paying a tariff instead. Yeah, you know, I, I have to agree with that. Um, I, and Maurice, I agree with your assessment that the FTA um, is not the, the, the panacea of, of, of all the issues and all the other things like demand. But two comments on that, where I agree with you. Um, there's, a relative, there's a relativism to it. So right now with 10% 301 China duties, you know, you got the RMB correcting by 6% and you have the remainder of the folks renegotiating their buy prices. So they take 10% 301 and you're right, we could live with that. But 35%, right, from China would absolutely change um, people's investment choices and consumer behavior, would consumers pay 35, 40% more for something? So so that's where I think, you know, at a low level, under 10%, 5%, 4%, I think I agree. Once you get into a higher level, tariffs can absolutely change uh, behavior and investment decisions. The second thing, and I love all the things you mentioned, like demand, what we haven't talked about is educating a U.S. workforce to compete in the global economy. So, you know, you can export services as well as manufacture consumer goods, right? And I find our own country, uh, it changes by region, um, you know, disastrously behind the rest of the world in educating folks to compete in a global service market. So if I look at all the jobs in LA County that are trade related, that are not in direct manufacturing, um, I would want to start getting young people interested in or educating them on, on, on becoming global trade specialists or, or um, opening up distribution warehouses close to ports of entry and ports of, ports of exit. So I do agree with you, it's demand, and um, I think it's the ability to export um, as many things as you can from your country, um, including export services. Um, if I can just mention that, just to go, talking about what the Department of Commerce has been doing in trying to build the U.S. exporter base as, as, a, as, a, you know, as a performance, uh, you know, as a key performance indicator of the organization. But one of the goals that we had over a number of years, anecdotally, was to increase the number of markets that a company was selling in overseas. There's so many companies that they're exporting, it's Canada and Mexico, maybe no
that's an easy step in trying to get people not yet exporting that could be exporting into it. And that's really 75% of the manufacturers. So to pick the low hanging fruit of the 25%, and Julianne and I, can talk <laughs> about, I, I was in the Commerce Department for many years right. in, in strategy development, we missed that point. That's why we have a new export initiative to increase the base of exporters, not just increase the number of countries existing exporters, exports. So if we crack that, we'll, we'll be a lot better off in, in the level of U.S. exports. Well, even in this course 2.0 deal, some people are wondering what's the benefit of increasing the, the uh, double the number of U.S. automobile exports uh, up to well, 50,000 cars. If currently, there's no company who's even reached to the uh, 25,000. And also, the, what's the benefit of extending this uh, the base up period? by 20 more years, because the Koreans are not selling this with uh, small pickup trucks to the US. Is that a really, uh, what, preventive measures? Or some people just curious about, I, I'm just I'll touch it. taking on your <laughs> points, and because, uh, you know, this FTA, some people think even this kind of thing is, uh, I wouldn't say it's irrelevant, but uh, I'm just wondering what, what's this sort of immediate benefit of putting this kind of stipulation change it because that uh, substantially actually that uh, it, it's not going to make a whole lot of change. I mean, we need to remember that Ford, GM, because remember Chrysler is now owned by a ton of company, um, aren't the only U.S. auto producers. You know, virtually every company in the world has professional abilities here. And, um, you know, we were talking about today at dinner that there are long-term projection issues in terms of sales in Korea that this benefits for long-term planning. But there is, a, because I've sold this privately, I won't say publicly, but one foreign producer who's probably getting close to that 25,000 limit. So there is a, a, an immediate rationale for it as well. Okay. On the actual question of the um, extension of the tariff, Hyundai did have a concept car, so they were looking to do this. And I would never want to say that correlation is causation, uh, but from a US manufacturer's perspective, you know, U.S. companies make most of the profits off, you know, light trucks. And Ford specifically is essentially eliminating all of its passenger vehicles other than Mustang, like one other vehicle, and they're gonna do it, uh, do it over like the next five years. So I think for Ford specifically, like I'm not saying that there was any coordination here, but I think for them, this is probably a really huge deal to avoid another competitor as they make this. Um, and I know there's a question that's submitted. Oh, thank you. I was going to really talk about what you mentioned, Dennis. Uh, sure. This level of education. And I'm a student at Santa Monica College. And the thing about it is, I'm starting a new career. And I'm studying global trade and logistics. And when I bring that up to people, most of them do not know what it is. And most of them do not know how it relates to everything that probably is in front of them or on their person. But this is a global trend. I think, I went to Georgetown many years ago. And in 1976, I was studying Arabic. And literally, someone in my class laughed at me. They said, there's no reason why you should be studying that. Americans don't really have a clear visibility on the world, where places are. I sometimes volunteer in local high schools that are teaching global citizenship or global studies. And within the curriculums, they still don't focus on, well, where places are and what they do. You said something very interesting, like in the South Korea is a baby Singapore. That one sentence is really huge in terms of how much information that it provides so that people are hearing it, yet they understand what Singapore is. Um, I, I, really, I, I really, the last two days I've been participating in this World Trade Week, and I'm learning as much as I can because global trade and, and logistics, which is what I'm focusing in, is so dynamic. And like people, even businessmen, you know, a lot of businessmen don't know how dynamic it is. So it's more of a statement. I don't have a solution. Uh, when I came down here this morning, my wife looked at me. She says, global week, month, how long is it? Korea? Okay. How much is parking? <laughs> uh, as, as a last note, so I'm actually at school the other day. 
I'm talking with a, with a girl, and she said she was from Eastern Europe. I says, oh, where, Ukraine? And she said, no. I said, Moldova? And when I said Moldova, which is where she was from, she became my best friend. I, the other day I was talking with a gentleman who was the consul from Kenya, and I talked to him about Kenya, what I know, and based on the fact that globally, but historically, when you look at Mombasa and other places where trade has gone through, Kenya's trying to do what they've been doing for centuries. He invited me to his table. I've got pictures of me now in the consul. He's like, wow, this is Kelvin. So, so th what you're saying, I, I agree with. And there has to be a better way to educate all of us here in America because that is the only way that things will happen is if the conversation starts. So first, I just want to say the paper that is really worth it. Right up there, CITD, um, LMU, um, has, and there's are some folks out there at Santa Monica College that can that can help. Um, being here, I think, is the best. You know, we will. I I had a finance marketing background from NYU, and I don't. How did I? 21 years old, I came up to LA, I picked this job, and now I'm in global trade, uh, knowing nothing about it in the beginning. Um, so stick with it. Um, the European, the Northern Europeans do this great. Like you go to Netherlands, you go to Germany, you go to the UK, they offer associate degrees, they offer degrees in global, global, global distribution, cross border. Um, they had a lot more borders prior to the EU than we did, so they needed more expertise about it. So I totally agree with you that um, the, the joke we used to have in 04 during the labor stoppage was, the, the ILW port labor stoppage, was Americans don't really ask questions about logistics until they're in the market, they go to reach for something on the shelf and it's not there, right? <laughs> and, that's, and that's when they say, wait, how does, how does it get from where it's made, where it's grown, to where I buy it? And until that happens, Ameri generally Americans don't really ask those questions. So I totally get what you're saying. Thank you. So that's why we have a cyber, so that we can kind of like uh, educate the students that, uh, in a way that uh, you're hoping for. Okay, Alex. It was great. Thank you very much for the insights into uh, changing the Korean social and economic landscape. And I was wondering um, a little bit about entrepreneurship and the changing nature of entrepreneurship in Korea. Um, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor cites that less than 40% of Korean working adults um, have a positive view of entrepreneurship as a career. Is that changing? Is that more nuanced than what you might otherwise think? Is it is it corporate entrepreneurship? Is are, are Koreans seeing the same um, rises in, in interest in the, the gig economy or individual types of work that we are in the United States? And, and if that is happening at all, is, what's the role of the chorus? Sure. Uh, I think that the idea, when that survey, like if you were to ask anybody about entrepreneurship, the traditional term, when I, I go to Korea, I'm actually leaving Korea tomorrow, uh, but, and Singapore and China, but um, the thing is, is like for Koreans, I think that the idea of traditional entrepreneurship is not appealing. What they don't realize is like these graphic designers and these creative artists that are coming out, everyone that's working in tech or using a computer to work and they're using being consultants, that's entrepreneurship as well. And I think that the younger demographic, the younger generation is more, they want to have a flexible schedule. They see sort of how Americans or how other tech people are working across global globally and they say they sort of, they want that. And that's what... I think that sense of entrepreneurship, but there's a huge uh, social stigma and the goal. Like you work so hard in Korea to go to, you know, Korea University or Yonsei, right? And you become first in your class, and your goal is to work at Samsung, starting off at fifty, you know, forty thousand maybe, and then you build your way up with hierarchy of chronological age as well as like just time there, and you eventually create a career and you become a corporate. See that, you know, hopefully you can become a C, you know, but it, it, it's rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I agree, I agree with Lincoln. Um, I, I think compared to where Korea was 10 years ago, I think, you know, more younger people are 
interested and willing to take chances in being an entrepreneur as we would understand it. I think traditionally in Korea, a lot of people who are entrepreneurs and why it has a negative stereotype are people who can't find jobs, you know, in the in the chable world or the bigger world, and they end up having a coffee shop or something, uh, or selling a very small shop or distributing one product they can't sell to somebody, you know. And so that has a really negative stereotype. But I think, you know, they're, they're Korea's record in terms of, of startups that have actually grown into larger successful companies is fairly abysmal. There are, not, there are a few good examples, but compared to even a lot of other countries, it's, it's, it's not very inspiring. But I think a lot of Korean younger people see what's happened States, they see what's happened in China and are taking chances in, in starting companies. Um, the creative economy centers that were created before, you know, a lot of it was geared towards providing a you know, co working space and resources um, to entrepreneurs. Some of them have programs to. companies, how valuable it was is another question. But um, so there's efforts out there. There is there are entrepreneurs probably more than there were before in terms of in the tech space, but um, it's still a very difficult proposition. In the in the startups you'll see uh, there's a company or there's a group, it's K Startup, it was founded by XG venture capitalists. Um, uh, that's they work in conjunction with KAIS. But uh, a lot of them were incubating in Korea, but a lot of the new startups and mobile apps or tech companies that are starting now, they're actually going to Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And they're like in developing countries and they're building. So those are entrepreneurs in and of themselves with angel investors or seed money coming from somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because there's a Russian company called Red Rocket and another Chinese company that are actually incubating those areas and they're monitoring and they're just copying those apps and taking them back to their other countries or syndicate him to Africa. So, I mean, it, it's just, technology is so fast, you just have to, yeah. and, and actually, there are Korean, there are Korean startups that are coming to the US, too. Yeah, yeah. And, under Y Combinator. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, Korea Innovation Center itself, and you know, yeah. we have one in, in Virginia, there's one in Silicon Valley, and I think a lot of Korean companies, if they encounter hurdles, particularly regulatory hurdles, they start looking that was the problem with my question, actually, is, is, is the, the blowover from Korea. I got the sense that entrepreneurs are starting to rise in that way. But it's also, I mean, the table, if you think about the Korean economy, they're like large canopy trees. Everything else underneath, you know, just kind of dies away. And so <laughs> if you want to be able to grow, because the table will either try to quickly acquire you, or, which is good, I guess, you know, sort of like here, you know, it's your way out. Or if you did want to build a business larger, they will try, if you won't sell, to you know, basically knock you out of the market any way they can. And so you almost need to go to either Indonesia, where maybe there's not as much competition, or come to the US, where there's competition, but there's a whole lot more space to maybe grow without being taken on. Chris, or Mark, do you want to start business and then some of the your... <laughs> So do you have any questions? Any sort of companies that Korea wants to come to the States and then uh, would like to help them? Yeah, well, um, Chris Lynch from the International Business Accelerator. Yeah, I, I think we, we've uh, been talking to a number of uh, Korean companies lately coming here, and I think it, it's, it's very much what you were saying in terms of the, the uh, space in order to be developing, particularly in the tech sector. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's one that, um, you know, given the particular affinity here with Los Angeles, um, uh, in Los Angeles and Korea, that it, it just makes sense. So I think that we're, we're going to be, be seeing more of that. Um, and, and then likewise, on the other side, it's, um, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we talked about, some of the space for the uh, small um, exports that we've done. We've worked with uh, uh, two companies, one company in particular that was uh, just doing a cosmetics going out to Korea. 
are taking advantage of the small chimneys <coughs> loophole, the de minimis provisions. Okay, uh, thanks for your insight. I have a quick question about uh, the country of origin. So, several of you have mentioned that issue. I know some Chinese companies are actually considering type of circumstances of the treaty. Do you consider that a viable option for those companies to uh, avoid a potential trade conflict? Thanks. So, oh, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. I forget for Vince, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I would caveat this in the sense of that if they establish, because I mean, Korea has promoted itself as an FTA hub, you know. Right. Build your factory in Korea, ship to China, the United States, the European Union. So if a Chinese company builds a factory and is producing something in Korea, that's completely and totally legitimate. Right. I will say, though, the administration, specifically on steel, mm -hmm. had concerns that basically China was trying to simply transship things through Korea. Right. So as long as we're not talking about transshipment of goods and everything, it's fine. So, you know, establishing a presence in South Korea, mm -hmm. producing there, and then using that to ship to the United States under the FTA rather than deal with, we'll say, the vagaries of what may happen in the U.S.-China relationship. You know, yeah, right. that would be perfectly acceptable. Yeah. So, and also, the, uh, what uh, Troy mentioned on steel, the same is true for textiles. There's been a lot of transshipment of textiles from uh, uh, from China that are repackaged in Korea, labeled as a product of Korea, and then attempting to send out those. So products. they're considered made in Korea, basically. No, they're no. just they're not made. to get the companies to take advantage of a trade agreement. The pitch that was coming out was <coughs> exports are good for the economy. More jobs if you export more. And so I said in this very room, I said, uh, <coughs> uh, that's not, <coughs> that's not going to hack it. What I need to know as an apparel manufacturer is, is, the du is that the duty is going to go from 13% to zero. If you tell me that, as, uh, instead of uh, some macroeconomic benefit, I might be more interested. Now, I don't necessarily see in the promotion of these trade agreements that we are focusing on what's in it for, for me, uh, for the vast majority of companies that might want to take advantage of it. Is, is there a, a strategy for promoting uh, these agreements? <laughs> so there's two aspects to this. And part of this, I think you're getting at basically the audience aspect. So. From a political standpoint, purely talking politics, going to Capitol Hill to sell a trade agreement, members of Congress aren't concerned about how many extra Fords, you know, or how many extra Mustangs Ford might ship to South Korea. Like, that's not going to sell it. Say, we're going to create X amount of jobs, it does. And if you actually look at the ITC study, uh, what it'll say on jobs is that this will be negligible because of the size of the economies. They don't make a prediction. Uh, all the predictions come out of basically there is a metric that commerce adjusts every year on basically on average a billion dollars of manufacturing or services exports equals Y jobs. 66,000. Is that what it is right now? It's yeah. terrible. It used to be 25,000 when I started then yeah. years ago. Just but, like what happened. And so then what happens is Sue Schwab, under the Bush administration, and then when the Obama people start doing it, they multiply that number out by what they think is going to be the growth in exports, and then they go around telling everybody, Create, I think, of course, it was like 60,000 jobs. What they should be doing is, yes, for Capitol Hill, even though the job numbers are really bad thing because they didn't get this whole thing about, well, of course, it's destroyed jobs, no, of course, created jobs, or vice versa, <coughs> is going to people and talking about, well, yes, if we export more, we're going to create more opportunities, we're create more jobs. I would avoid the numbers, but that's what they should tell Congress. What they then, though, should go to you specifically and say, this is what it's going to do for your industry. So when, um, we would do, because uh, we, my organization, we do a lot of events. We go to universities. We bring uh, somebody from the State Department to create an embassy out to World Affairs Councils and meet with the business community and stuff in different cities. What we always try to do when we do these types of things, we're talking about choruses, specifically like right after the negotiated, was say, okay, what does LA export, or what does California more generally, because maybe sometimes you can't get the city specific data. 
to you know, Korea, or what does it maybe produce that maybe it's not exporting, but now because the tariff is going to be gone, you know, so for example, um, and I'll be honest, I don't know if cashews are grown in California, but I'm just going to use cashews now. Uh, there were virtually no cashew exports before, of course, because of the tariff and everything. Now there's a decent amount. You'll see street vendors roasting cashews and everything. So that's the kind of thing, you know, to tell business community. So if you're going somewhere, it's agricultural, be like, so here's what it's going to do to the agricultural side. This is why, you know, you might want to be thinking about if you can get your, you know, cashew or whatever into the Korean market. Yeah, and for when chorus was negotiated, I don't know what was put out, but um, when TPP was getting clo clo close to conclusion, the Department of Commerce actually had a very elaborate campaign focused on getting knowledge of the benefits of, of TPP to businesses around the country. I mean, it was like a year-long campaign uh, last year with the Obama administration. Sign, you know, trying to get sector by sector information out there. If you go on the internet, it hasn't been taken down. You can still see it. And so there was a major campaign across the country to get more detailed information out at companies in particular businesses. Say, hey, maybe I can sell in Vietnam after this or something like that. Okay, before we wrap up the program, uh, I don't know where the business went, but uh, he had to take. Oh, okay. so, uh, I'd like to ask uh, each town is just uh, uh, maybe the final uh, if you have a one or two things that uh, you recommend uh, to the tax brothers or the investors in Korea, what would be your recommendation? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to mention like you because you asked like from an audience point of view, a consumer point of view, like what's in it for me, right? And I think that that kind of mentality as an entrepreneur or someone that's doing business or trade is not the best mentality to approach because you're not, America or the course should not spoon feed you business and this is like a great way. They, you, this free trade agreement and the course should facilitate an opening or a channel, an opportunity. And it's up to you to, to as an entrepreneur, as business, that's what all Americans do to create that. With that said, um, with that said, you know, it's like opening up a website. It's like, I opened up a website, now buy my product. Why isn't anyone buying it, right? Uh, one of the things I think we didn't really talk about is like how we could use taxes and to, to gatekeep and to create a supply and demand for certain products and restrict and go back and forth, not just keeping a free trade open. Um, I think, again, like going back to highlighting, I think one of the things that has proven myself, it's been, like, you know, and I said, I am able to speak on a couple other things just because I sit on advisory boards for you know, tech companies as well, um, is that you know you have to localize your product. It's and it's not about you know the chorus is great. It you know but it has its advantages and disadvantages uh, from a macro point of view. I think macroeconomics and for like you know commodities in agriculture uh, or for commodities or like natural gas, it's great. But for small businesses, it's not that beneficial uh, to a lot of people because. They feel like, oh, less taxes means they'll just, anyone will buy, but it, you know, you really have to localize and look at the supply and demand um, and the brand perception of U.S. and its commodities. Well, I guess to build off what Lincoln was saying, if you're in the Korean market, and this is sort of gets back to the distributor question earlier, you know, when I go into a Korean store, you'll see Many of the things you buy in the US, it's more expensive in Korea. That's because there's this huge markup. And one of the things that the Korean government tried to do, um, and they did it sort of ham handedly, is probably the best way to say it is, they really wanted to show that there was a benefit to Korean consumers from chorus. And so they went about going saying, oh, why is the price for this commodity not come down? The 20% tariff is off and everything to try and sort of shame companies into you know, reducing the price. But, you know, keep this all in context in that. When you go into the Korean market, and I think this is why people go into Canada or Mexico, you know, there is a certain familiarity. You know, either you're speaking English or French if you're in Quebec or in Spanish, and you can always find some easily who speaks, you know, Spanish in the U.S. Uh, so, 
Korea, it's not going to be that there's going to be cultural differences, and you know, some of these will be the way you build the relationship will be slightly different than you know in the United States and Canada. Some of this will be in the subtleties and how those relationships are established, and that's just going to be something that is going to require additional help. Uh, maybe finding a Korean American business partner if you're not Korean American or something uh, to help navigate some of that because there are going to be things that will subtly matter and that will make your challenge more difficult. And so finding someone who can help you manage that cultural context of the relationship, I think, is going to be important. Yeah, Troy said, I mean, every, you know, localizing your product is, clear, is critical. Understanding the consumer or the buyer in any foreign market is critical. Korea is, you know, is a little more complex than a lot of countries, but you know, obviously a lot of um, what I would just observe is just in the, the world is changing so quickly and it's changed so much in the last you know, 15 years is that the ability to develop new business models is seems a lot more um, available now than it may have been in the past. So you know if you're you know this the you know, ex exporting directly to the consumer in Korea from the U.S. you know pre-chorus it existed but wasn't so popular now there are a lot of companies Simple, but the expansion of Costco in Korea, for example, uh, you go to the, the Costco in uh, Yangjae in Seoul. It's the number one Costco in the world in terms of revenue in any single Costco store in the world. And increasingly, they're a big importer. They're, that's how companies are getting into the market um, for wine, um, for you know, uh, fruits and vegetables, and even cons some consumer products. Sell your product through Costco, and, and that place is jammed every day of the week. I mean, you can barely it's get it. Costco's bad here. So I mean, it's, so that's another channel. If, you know, with ease of communications, with startups, with incubators and accelerators available, and talking to each other, with WeWork programs and whatever, the ability to get ideas and business propositions and new exchange ideas, that, which can result in. Much more prevalent, and Koreans are super quick uh, in taking advantage of that, and Americans can learn a lot from that. So, you know, I, I'd say this is actually a great time to be out there in the business world um, and exploring because that's the way you find a model that can work for you, and it may not be just as direct as it was 20 years ago. I was also told the IKEA, the largest store, the IKEA in the in Seoul, Korea. Well, I don't know if it's the largest, but they did build one, and they didn't put adequate parking, and so it's caused a massive traffic jam. Um, so it, too, is quite popular. Okay, thanks. At this point, I'd like to thank the, all the panelists for uh, you know, your contribution and uh, uh, sharing your insights and experiences with the audience. And then, um, mostly, that I'd like to thank all the people that uh, show up today, and uh, hopefully that you learned something from our, our discussion today. So thank you so much.